but he continues to wrestle with a desire for control and a sense of entitlement. And we're, I was sharing during the break, we're working through issues like, how do you, how do you co-parent with him when uh, her survivors of abuse parent from a position of advocating for their children and protecting them from their spouse? Very different from parenting as a team. So how, how, how do you become a teammate with someone that you can 100% trust? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. That's something I'm continuing to work through. So um, I guess the answer is uh, I don't completely know. I, I can tell you what it looks like to get them to weather together again, mm -hmm. and there's not a constant environment of abuse. That happens. That can happen. But that doesn't mean all the kinks are ironed out. There's still things to work on and kinks to iron through. Huge reliance on the Holy Spirit. Huge reliance on the Holy Spirit. The one thing she said uh, recently when I, when I was teaching last time, uh, not here, um, at our church, when I was going through forgiveness, and she said the biggest battle for me has been learning to forgive every day. I had the big initial confession of sin with tears and forgiveness and working toward reconciliation, but now I have to forgive every day, and that's what's hard. Um, so, as I'm talking about the men are there because they have to be, Essentially, I have to jump through this hoop or I'll lose my wife. Um, men enter the program because of external motivation, fear of consequences. Um, that's universal. Uh, no man has ever come to turning point, or I've never met with one, who believes he's abusive and needs to change when they start. But at some point in the change process, that external motivation needs to shift to internal motivation. They need to realize, you know what? I have a big problem, and now I'm here because I want to change for the sake of Christ and honoring Him, not because of you know, whatever my wife does is what my wife does. I'm here now because of Christ. If that shift doesn't happen, He won't change. Uh, he may complete the program. He may learn behaviors and put on a good front that will last for a while, but eventually it will break down and He'll go back to abuse. If that shift does happen, then you've got some tracks to run but it, so that's basically what it looks like. He's there solely because he has to be, and then at some point in the process, a shift needs to make needs to be made. Your goal in ministering to abusive men is a changed heart. Uh, as I said earlier, Scripture teaches our actions flow from the desires of his heart, of our hearts. So his beliefs need to be changed and replaced with biblical beliefs. Um, if you just focus on changing his behavior. It will not work. This is the number one mistake in ministering to abusers. Give him, here's how to act. You just focus on behavior. His beliefs have to change. And then right behavior flows from that. It's absolutely essential. Uh, the secular batterer programs believe the exact same thing, which is, which is the reason why I got trained there. Mm -hmm. Specifically, um, there's, I could go on and on about what beliefs need to change, but I'm just going to give you three that, that are the most important. Uh, his beliefs about women. Most abusive men believe that men are superior to women. Uh, they may not actually say that. In fact, most of them won't, because they know it's not exactly socially acceptable anymore. But that's what they believe. Uh, I had one guy say to me <laughs> in a, in a, during a, the Turning Point group session, well, women are the weaker vessel, and so, which is from First Peter, but he completely misinterprets what that means. Um, women are the weaker vessel, and so, you know, they run on emotion, um, they get charged up about things, and you as a man need to bring logic and reason to the situation. Did he say men are superior to women? No. No, not those words. But you better believe he, that's what he thinks, without a doubt. Um, without a doubt. Um, he, that was his second or third time coming. And it was great. It's one of the benefits of, of doing counseling in groups. I was, instead of me saying you're a moron, which is what I wanted to say, um, I was able to say, what do you guys think? And some of the guys who've been around for a while, one of them instantly said, I'm way more emotional than my wife is. And another guy said, me too. And this guy just completely was taken aback. And I was able, they were able to correct him and speak to him. And it's powerful when, when peers or other abusers Very much so. correct you. It's yeah. much more powerful than yeah. me doing it. Um, much more powerful. So, um, 
It goes back to entitlement, uh, having a superior status um, with exclusive rights and privileges. So you need to teach them that women are created in God's image just like men. They have value, they have dignity, and they deserve to be treated with respect. That's something that we pound into them. Genesis 1 is our home in Turning Point. We're there over and over and over again. Um, we say things like, um, what, you know, what does the need for a helper imply about Adam's sufficiency? Well, it implies he was insufficient. It's not good that the man should be alone. Um, things like that to undo their thinking and their beliefs. Their, lead, their beliefs about leadership need to change. Abusive men assume that leadership equals control. It, it's an assumption they don't even know they have. Leadership equals control and domination is the assumption. His definition of leadership needs to change to servant leadership. Um, Jesus says in Mark 10, 42 through 44, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, entitlement, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what it looks like to love your wife as Christ loves the church. Mark 10. That's servant leadership. The, the, the formula for successful biblical leadership is service, sacrifice, and death. Dying unto yourself. Um, and that's antithetical to abuse. Also his beliefs about marriage and family. Instead of viewing it as a pyramid of power, he needs to view a relationship as a, as a uh, marriage as a relationship of mutuality. Another important thing is to help him develop empathy for his wife. Mm. A prerequisite for abuse is not having empathy. You, you, not for anyone, but for your partner. You cannot abuse someone when you care about how she feels. Uh, you typically abuse her as an object. And so you need to help him learn how to care about his wife's feelings and to think about how his behavior is impacting her. Mm. He doesn't need to be Mr. Sensitive you know, or a psychotherapist. But he needs to recognize the way I act actually impacts my wife. And I need to think about it. I need to think about how I'm impacting her. I need to care. Yeah. And listen. And listen, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of method, the, the best option is a batterer's intervention program. As I said last night, marriage counseling does not work. Does not work. If you have questions about why, I can, I can talk with you later, but... Um, it does, marriage counseling does not work for abusive relationships. Typically, it actually is harmful. Uh, anger management does not work. As we said, he, he doesn't really have an anger problem per se. He has a control problem. Anger management is just that. It's tools for managing your behavior. Uh, when you look at their curriculum, it does not focus on beliefs and desires and motives of the heart. It's all surface behavior. One of the greatest areas of frustration in the field of domestic abuse is how often judges assign um, abusers anger management instead of batterers intervention. It's a source of universal frustration. Um, anger management does not work. What he needs is a heart transplant. And that's very different from techniques for managing your behavior. Individual counseling has a very low success rate. Uh, it's hard to pierce through minimizing, denying, and blame shifting. Uh, abusive men become very defensive in one-on-one -on -one sessions, and when a person becomes defensive, their ability to learn shuts down. So one-on-one, -on -one, it's not that it's impossible, but it's very, very difficult, very, very low success rate. Um, so the most successful form of treatment is a batterer's intervention program. It counsels men in groups. So instead of me sitting down with an abuser and trying to get him to see how sinful he is, we discuss a topic as a group. Instead of me saying, hey, bud, you are economically abusing your wife. You're doing this, this, and this. Instead, it's, all right, men, today we're going to discuss finances and marriage. And then as you discuss it, you weave in the patterns of economic abuse. And they sit there themselves and hear other people in the group talk about things that they've done with their wives. But they're not, they don't have to get defensive because you're not personally attacking them. 
So where and then the men are able to confront one another instead of me having to do it. That's much more constructive. All right. I'm sorry we're going so far over. Um, a good way to facilitate this is a structured separation. Um, this is the last thing I, I need to cover. We talked about it last night. I'll go through it real briefly. Basically, the wife and children separate from the husband to ensure their safety. Uh, I highly recommend placing the husband under church discipline. Um, then you help the wife create a document, and it's her document. Her, she creates it. You're her scribe. Um, you give her things to think about, options to consider, and whatnot, but she makes the decisions. You help her create a document that outlines who's going to live where, how finances are going to work, and what steps both parties are going to take to lead to the restoration of their marriage. So she's going to attend a support group or get counseling from this person. He's going to attend a batterer's intervention program. Here's the specific ways he's going to change his behavior. He's going to not do these things. He's going to do these things. Um, if he's under church discipline, those of you who are familiar with the center of admonition, you can just copy and paste from the center of admonition right into the structure of separation when it comes to change. Then you put a time frame on it. He should demonstrate changed behavior for six months to a year before they move back in. Demonstrate changed behavior. And really, I would say, I'm really considering taking this six months off. Yeah. Uh, it should be a year. Turning Point is a 40-week program, and the only reason it's not 52 is I didn't think people would agree to it. Um, it takes a long time. So a year um, is, is certainly preferable. I've seen couples get back together after three months. I've never seen one of those work. I've seen a couple at six months fall apart. Um, so it just it takes a long time. It takes a long time to change. Um, so a structured separation provides the abuser with consequences for his actions. It provides him with formal accountability. And it provides him with a goal to attain. Essentially, there's a lot of motivation there. Um, remember I said, if he's not accountable, he will not change. So, um, And again, I, I know... Yeah, come on. Any questions uh, before we close in prayer? Does the husband know that the wife is looking up this document? I think that would go over a little bit. Sometimes, sometimes not. Um, Sometimes she leaves covertly without his knowledge, and then if she wants to stay married, we present it with him later. Mm -hmm. Other times he does know. It really is up to her. I just feel really tough for the loser to have the wife doing all the controlling as to what she's putting in the Yeah. Those are consequences. It's wonderful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it really is. Uh, they are his consequences for his actions. And, yeah, what were we going to A lot of abusers, addicts as well. It's Alcohol, common. drugs. Yeah, it's common. Um, the, the way I... Substance abuse is a contributing factor, like growing up in an abusive home. It's not a cause. A lot of people are, substance, are addicts and not abusive. A lot of abusers have been stone cold sober their entire lives, particularly in the Christian circles. So what substance abuse does is it lowers your inhibitions. So it makes whatever is in your heart more likely to come out. The question is, why is abuse what's in his heart? So yeah, a lot of times there is a correlation and when he is um, high or drunk, that's when abuse may occur the most. But if he was sober, he would still be abusive. Does that make sense? Yes. One thing before we close, um, we are considering and um, exploring the idea of having a refuge ministry here at Village 7. If you're all, all interested in uh, knowing more about that, exploring that with us, I'm going to put a sheet here. It's blank. Put your name on the back. And we'll, uh, we'll contact you or fill one. So, um, <laughs> Phil was excited. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, I was thinking with our School of Mercy Ministry coming up that if this is something the church really wants to go forward with, that we could. It's too soon. <laughs> We, we, we're not we're not close enough yet. I, I would suggest. Well, yeah, yeah. I thought we might find people who are interested. Yeah. In yeah. And then, yeah. You, Any input from that, though. So at that time, I'm I'm coming one time. I might be able to present during that time. Okay, so. uh, I think that especially men like to see results, and so this has become a little bit of a disappointing kind of discouraging thing. But I believe that what, for what the has women, discouraging? the process, uh, the because the um, 
the success has not been proven. So you're working with this man and you're counseling. He's a pastor. He should know better. He's a Christian. But, but what we do for the women and what we do for the children, when we stand by them and say, this is just against God's wonderful, wonderful love for you, I think that that just overcomes any kind of results that we are looking for first. You know, um, and I also believe that the, if the woman has that power that she is directly saved by God, that she is directly before his presence and his throne and all his glory, that that will change him too. Eventually, it could be the day he dies. But, um, you know, so that we would not be discouraged because we don't see successes, mm -hmm. but that we would do whatever it is that God is calling us to do. Right. And yeah. I think that's the exact point, is we do what we're called to do to help the process and the results are God's. Yeah, sure. All right. So we quickly close this in prayer. And uh, thank you, Shane. And we really appreciate it. Father, we thank you. And you are the, the God who loves the oppressed. And it, uh, you adopt us as your children. Lord, we pray for the women in this church who have been abused. Lord, protect them. And Lord, we pray that you will um, allow us to minister. Uh, and minister deeply. Lord, pray for men who are abusers, that um, that they may become convicted, and that you will um, restore, and uh, that you will do a deep work of repentance. Lord, thank you for Shane and uh, his ministry to us over the last couple days. Uh, be with him in ministry up in Kalispell, and help us to uh, find ways to, uh, to duplicate some of that here in Colorado Springs. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.